Hi, this is Mish Hancock, and you are listening to Mishmash, a place where I get to talk to the weird, wacky, wonderful people of this world, people I adore and want to know more mm. about. Today, my guest is Dan Flynn. Dan is a St. Louis area funeral director. He shares a new funeral dynamic that gets us thinking outside the box. Hello, Dan. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm fine. Hope you are too. I am as well. And sir, you have been quite busy as of late with COVID. Absolutely. Tell us about what you've been doing. Well, um, it's not that the death rate has gone up in, in a much noticeable way because of COVID, but from my own experience, um, I was, uh, I'm a federal responder with the, the government and I'm on the federal government's mass fatality team, what we call a DMORT team. And DMORT stands for Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team. And there are 10 teams across the United States. And I was assigned to go to New York at the height of their uh, pandemic. And when I say the height of it, it's flattened out quite a bit now, but I spent pretty much the entire month of April in New York. And at one point we were losing 1200 people a day Oh my gosh! over and above the normal death rate. One of the things that people lose sight of during an incident like this is even through all the COVID, we're still losing people the normal way old age, traffic accidents, homicides, suicides, drug overdoses, whatever it may be. So when we talk about death per day due to COVID, you have to add that number on top of the normal load that you were dealing with. So even for a city the size of New York with all of their assets, uh, an additional 1,200 deaths a day uh, is insurmountable. And that's when they call in the federal team when the local jurisdiction has been overwhelmed. Uh, now, obviously, depends on the size of the jurisdiction. Uh, here in Missouri, uh, several years ago, we had the Joplin tornado. Right. But it was in such a rural area that the local jurisdiction could only handle five fatalities at one time. And in uh, the blink of an eye, they had 156. So for Joplin, that was overwhelming. Well, in New York, 1,200 a day on top of the normal workload was overwhelming. So we were sent in. I can't imagine. And I mean, and I can't imagine for the families, that's got to be especially difficult. Yes, well, uh, certainly uh, loss of life is, is difficult for anybody. Um, one of the most difficult uh, cases that I dealt with was actually some friends I had in Southern California who called me and said, our mother has passed away in Manhattan, not from anything COVID related, but she just died of old age in a, in a nursing home. And she died in the middle of all this activity. The people who were really hardest hit, uh, oddly to say, was the uh, funeral homes. I was working in one of the city morgues and we were releasing bodies on a daily basis to local funeral homes. And I stopped and talked to one of the funeral home people uh, one day and I said, how's it going for you? And he said, uh, we normally, we're a small family firm and we would normally have maybe two cases a week. He said, this is the 30th person I picked up today. Oh my gosh. So, and, and so how, how did they deal with this? I mean, what was the, well, originally uh, it, it was a real problem for them uh, because the average family funeral home uh, to use that term, uh, they can store maybe five, maybe uh, uh, 10 bodies uh, during the COVID uh, incident in New York the federal government brought in fleets of refrigerated 18 wheelers. That's what I was going to ask. Refrigeration had to have been, I mean, top of mind. Right. Well, and that's, that's our normal procedure is we bring in these refrigerated 18 wheelers and we build shelving in them and they 
become rolling morgues, really. And what we do is several, uh, there's 30 hospitals in the New York metropolitan area. Each hospital was given three or four trailers. And as people died in the hospital, their bodies were put into these trailers. When the trailer was full, it would be sent to, uh, we set up a federal morgue uh, in Brooklyn and they were sent there for further processing. Everybody had to be identified and uh, photographed and uh, put into the medical examiner's uh, computer system. <clears throat> so um, <coughs> now we have hundreds, thousands of bodies in these trailers and now the uh, funeral home has to come pick them up, okay? Right. The funeral home, uh, the, I guess normal procedure in New York, uh, the funeral home has a week to pick up a body from the medical examiner's custody. Well, they didn't change that rule. They said a week. And so these funeral homes were just picking up body after body after body. And they don't have those big refrigerated trailers to store them in. Right. Uh, and a lot of the bodies, uh, you know, people were in body bags. Now, let me back up a second to, to tell your listeners, a body either has to be refrigerated or embalmed. Once a body is embalmed, um, it, it doesn't need to be refrigerated anymore and can actually, you know, be perfectly fine in the hallway for a couple of weeks. Really? Uh, yeah. So um, uh, that was what had to happen. You had to embalm these bodies because as a small family funeral home, you didn't have enough refrigeration space. The bottom line was, whether it was refrigerated or not, you had your chapel, let's say, just full of row after row of bodies. And the end result is there are still people, it, we're what, uh, middle of September, um, there are people who are still waiting to have a funeral for their loved one who may have died back in March or April. Uh, there's just, you, you would have to have drive up funerals round the clock to handle that many people. Now, going back to my friend in Los Angeles, her mother died in Manhattan and she couldn't even get a funeral home to pick up the phone. Most funeral homes stopped answering the phone. Just completely because overwhelmed. Uh, at best, you might get a uh, voicemail on their phone line saying, we're sorry, but we can't handle any more cases. Wow. So uh, I had to go out because of, luckily because of my proximity, uh, I was able to go out and find a funeral home that was able to take my friend's mother's case. Uh, so, and another interesting dynamic is the way we handle the deceased is very cultural and that right. cultural difference you can see it from east to west so here's what i mean by that in california if uh an indigent person dies uh, they become a ward of the county if you will and the county has them cremated it uh, back east uh, and even here in St. Louis, an indigent person or an unclaimed person, um, and that becomes a ward of the county as well, but they're buried. Now think about that. When you're talking about thousands of people, uh, rather than cremating them, each one of those people has to be casketed and buried. Right. And many people saw on the news the uh, footage of Heart Island. And Heart Island is uh, an island there in the river next to Manhattan and has been used for 150 years as kind of a boot hill uh, or a, a, a potter's field, however you want to say it. But it's where the indigent and the unknown are buried. But here's the fascinating thing. Um, they made it sound like, to, to be sensational, they made it sound like New York City is burying people in mass graves. And they showed the drone footage of the big trench being cut and all the boxes being stacked up. Uh, what they didn't bother to tell you is it's actually the most amazing filing system you've ever seen. 
uh, as part of my job in New York, I was one of the people putting people in those pine boxes. And on the end of the box, all of their information was written, their case number and their date of death and the name if we knew it and that sort of thing. And then the, the boxes are stacked up in the trench and the trench is covered over. Uh, thousands of bodies in there. But 20 years from now, you could go back to the medical examiner in New York and say, I think my uncle was one of those people buried during COVID. And they would show you a bunch of photographs and you would say, that's him. And they could really? go back to they could go back to the exact spot in that trench where thousands of people are buried and exhume just him from wow. the grave. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing That's filing incredible. system. And another interesting point about this whole thing is during the height of the COVID incident, even with the Hart Island and the mass burial, um, the city of New York, the medical examiner's office, the office of the chief medical examiner, as it's called, was not doing anything that they don't do on a daily basis. They were just doing it on a much larger scale. So no procedures were changed. Heart Island wasn't a new thing. As I mentioned, Heart Island has been used as their pauper's field for 150 years. It's just the pace was picked up. Got ya. So. So, and I'm, I'm sure that there's some religious um, reasons out there why, you know, I, I believe that some people don't be, like cremation is not something that they, they wish for and feel is, an, is a good idea. But for the indigent people, I mean, it seems like that would be a better solution. Am I wrong? Um, well, uh, uh, let's take that question one step at a time. The Jewish and the Muslim faiths strictly forbid cremation. Okay. Um, uh, but <laughs> one thing I've learned is uh, being Jewish is a lot like being Catholic. It's on a yes. scale. How, yes, ca gotcha. how Catholic am I today? Yes, exactly. Um, so I'm with you. <laughs> I, I, I've cremated a lot of Jewish people. Uh, okay. I've never cremated a Muslim, but I've cremated a lot of Jewish people. Uh, so, but there is that heavy influence. And a lot of these procedures, keep in mind, back east, particularly on the eastern seaboard, they've been doing it that way since before cremation was even invented. Uh, cremation does not become a thing until uh, the second half of the uh, uh, 1800s. Okay. So uh, it didn't evolve as part of their culture. Whereas if you look at the West Coast, by the time that that was up and running, cremation was already a thing. So, so what are the, uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, you shared with me earlier is there are other alternatives to, you know, I think most of us are familiar with the traditional funerals, you know, and the burial, and then, and then we are familiar with cremation, but there's, there's a lot of other options out there now. Well, when a person dies in, in the, in the funeral industry, we use the term disposition. What is their final disposition? Um, so in the United States, there are still only two dispositions, burial or cremation. Okay. But what has changed and what has evolved is the way in which we handle those things. Uh, now, let me make a caveat. Uh, the state of Washington has just come up with a third uh, option. Uh, okay. They're the only state who has it, which is human composting. Uh, very similar, really? yeah, very similar to some of the uh, uh, traditions like in uh, Nepal and Tibet and places like that. Uh, India tried it, uh, didn't work out well uh, in that size of population. But yeah, literally um, uh, turning the body back into soil, uh, basically the same process as would naturally occur Okay. Uh, to somebody who has a green burial. Um, and let me define that term. A lot of people aren't familiar with the term green burial. I'm not. We've all been to uh, grandma's funeral and we went to the grave site and we saw, uh, first of all, we saw her during her wake. Uh, she was embalmed. She was dressed up, had her hair and makeup done. And then the, she was buried in a metal casket probably. 
Um, and then we went out to the grave site and her metal casket is lowered into the grave, but it's not a, an empty hole that she's lowered into. She's lowered it into a concrete box called a vault that was put in the hole before the family even got there. Right. So traditionally, an embalmed person is put into a metal casket, which is put into a concrete vault that's then put in the ground. Green burial. Now, uh, that person is going to be there for a thousand years. Right. Green burial takes it back to the way we used to do it prior to uh, the end of the First World War and the Spanish influenza epidemic, where you are wrapped in a shroud, you know, either a, a, a cotton or a silk shroud, uh, and you were just literally laid in the ground. Got you. Boom. So it's kind of going back to the earth. Right, right. So somebody who's buried in that state uh, obviously will uh, decompose and go back to the earth like most of us want to be. Uh, there are still people out there who know I, I, I want my loved one to to be preserved as long as possible. And you, you got to scratch your head and say why. But if Just that's what you want. We can reanimate anyone later, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah, but now you're full of embalming <laughs> fluid. So you it wouldn't want to be. No, no. <laughs> um, so um, you have that green burial. Um, and, and the idea is that you uh, decompose and you go back to nature as quickly as possible. And that's the way that we buried people for thousands of years prior to the creation of embalming uh, after the Civil War. Uh, so human composting speeds up that process uh, and turns the person basically into soil. Um, it, it, so any kind of composting, that's basically the definition of it, is it's a process that speeds up what would naturally happen anyway. Got, yeah. Right? And then I believe you also told me something about something that has to do with the sea. Yes. Um, uh, full body burials at sea. Uh, just like in the old pirate movies or okay. uh, uh, one of my favorite movies, Master and Commander with Russell Crowe. Uh, in those movies, they show that when somebody uh, dies at sea, um, they are stitched up in their hammock uh, and slid off of a board. You know, they lift the board and the body slides into the ocean out from under the flag. And a lot of people don't realize that that is still legal. It's always been legal. When I tell people about this, without exception, their first comment is, is that legal? Well, yeah, that's like, what, I mean, it, it, it no, seems I, I, you know, <laughs> like something you would do if you're up to no good. So, you know. No, but it, and, and here's a, the, the last burial at sea that I did was for a man who uh, was a merchant sailor during World War II and actually had to perform burial at sea with some of his own shipmates. Because if you think about it, going back, it's a little different nowadays, but going back to the day, you didn't have refrigerators uh, on a ship. Oh, right. and, and you may be at sea for three months. What are you supposed to do with this dead body? There's no refrigeration. You, and bombing hasn't been invented yet. And uh, uh, you're not going to see land for months. So it was actually a very respectful way of disposing of the body. They didn't just pick you up and throw you overboard. There was a whole, right. there was a whole ceremony involved. So and, and this is the ocean, yes, right? Now, in the ocean. what about like rivers and lakes and that kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, now you're into, you know, a mafia movie. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. I was this, just wondering, like, you know, can I be like, hey, put me in the Mississippi. You, know? um, uh, you can do that with ashes, but not with uh, a full body. Gotcha. The full body burial is actually administered by the federal government. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I would have thought it was, uh, you know, regulated by the U.S. Coast Guard, let's say. It's actually regulated by the U.S. EPA because you are d putting something into the ocean. Right. And uh, federal law requires that you be three miles offshore and in 600 feet of water. Okay. So obviously you can't do that in the Mississippi. Right, I gotcha. Or like, you know, Lake St. Louis or anything like that. And 
are there any other options out there that we don't know about? In this country, uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with the uh, open pyre of uh, uh, cremations that they do in India. Right. Um, and there is a whole ceremony behind that, which we uh, uh, deal with here in the United States when somebody loses a, a member of the family in a Hindu family. Okay. Um, I had to cremate uh, a Hindu priest whose son was also a Hindu priest. And there are all kinds of uh, ceremonies uh, that are part of their ritual, most of which, unfortunately, are not legal in the United States. So yeah. they don't get to do a lot of the things that they would like to do that they do back home, but we try and accommodate them as much as possible. Um, the United States, interestingly enough, there's one place that somehow is getting away with doing open pyre cremations. And that's a little community in Colorado. And um, this community basically said, we don't care what the law is, we're doing it anyway. Gotcha. And Colorado is the most liberal of the states when it comes to death. Right. And uh, you don't even have to have a license to be a funeral director in Colorado. Really? And, yeah. And so uh, the, the, the government in Colorado said, okay, look, we're not going to stop you from doing this, but we're going to restrict it. And you can only do it to people who are residents of this county. And because they didn't want like every Hindu person in the United exactly. States and, and every eco-friendly person in the United States lining up, for, it, it'd be round the clock. Uh, so uh, they did restrict it in that way. But other than that one place in Colorado, the only choices you have in the United States are burial or cremation, or in Washington state, you can now be composted. Now, uh, there have been some advancements um, 14 of the 50 states now allow what's called water cremation. Now, when we think of cremation, we think of heat cremation, right. where you're put into the cremation machine, what we call a retort, and um, your body is, is incinerated at about 1,800 degrees, and what's left is just the major bones of the skeleton. Those bones are then processed, down to a powder. And when we say, here's grandma's ashes, it's not really her ashes, it's her skeleton that has been ground to a powder. Really? Yeah. The bones survive that kind of heat? The, the major bones, yeah. Wow. Um, and then, uh, and the average person produces about six pounds of, of that ash, or, or what's tech, the, the real term for it is cremains. Instead of remains, it's cremains. Cremains, gotcha. Yes, the remains of cremation. How now, does the water work? Water cremation. <clears throat> Do you remember your mother or your grandmother talking about washing clothes, washing with lye soap? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of taking a bar of lye soap and holding it in your hand. Just I holding a not. bar of lye soap in your hand. If you hold it there for a minute or so, it actually starts to burn you. Got yeah. And as, if we remember back to high school biology. Um, uh, or chemistry, on one side of the pH scale is acid. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the pH scale is base. What people don't remember is that a base, an extreme base, will burn you just like an extreme acid. So in water cremation, you're put into a big silver tube. Um, the tube is filled with warm water and lye soap is added. And after a few hours, you are dissolved. Um, wow. Yeah. A few hours. Yeah. So wow. uh, um, uh, it's what I refer to as your final spa treatment. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, a lot of people, their objection to cremation, even though their logical brain says, I'm going to be dead. Right. Their illogical brain says, I don't want to be burned up. I'm afraid of fire. Oh, that terrifies me. The idea of being burned up. This way, you're in a nice warm bath and you just oh. dissolve away. And then the uh, uh, what's left over, uh, similar to heat cremation, is your skeleton. The, the skeleton is, again, processed down to a powder, and that is returned to the family. So now, do you, are you aware? I mean, you know, I'm, as we are, again, mm -hmm. possibly getting back into the whole, you know, we're working toward 
getting to Mars and there's all these, all this energy around NASA. We've got the International Space Station. Is there a, any procedure in place for that in the case that someone dies on the space station? Um, well, now, just knowing, the only thing I know about all that is what I've seen in movies. And what I would do if somebody died on the space station is I would take them out for a spacewalk without their little space suit on and they'd freeze that quickly. Got ya. Okay, so, uh, and they would probably be strapped to the outside of the space station until the next shuttle comes along. Gotcha. Um, I will say, and this is where I thought you were going with this question. We'll um, go. Let's we, hear it. When you're, when you're cremated, we can shoot your ashes into space. Um, you can, and, and you can actually be shot into space with Gene Roddenberry's ashes. Really? Uh, yeah. Well, how, wait, how does that work? So you've got my ashes and do you just attach them to a rocket and off? Yep. Yep. SpaceX and, and there's, there's a company that's kind of a subcontractor to SpaceX and they shoot your ashes into space and you can decide whether you want to be shot into orbit or whether you want to be shot into deep space where you just keep going. I'll be darn. Yeah. That is yeah. Okay. So look, everybody, there's lots of ways, right? You don't have no. to go with the traditional, you can, you can get your wills out and put your well, wishes and, down. And the other thing is once you're cremated, one of the advantages to cremation is that there are so many options. I can put, I can turn you into fireworks. Your family can actually watch a fireworks display what? and, and that's I your ashes. I just had a pyrotechnician on. I'll have to let Rob yeah. Seema know that this is something you could look into. Would you give me my really? number, please? Yeah. I uh, would be happy to. <laughs> I, I can turn your ashes into a diamond ring. I can put you in a shotgun shell. I can, uh, oh my gosh, there, there's just like no, no limits. Really? To it. A diamond ring? Yeah. I, what is the, how, well, what's the if you cost think, on that one? Well, it all depends on how big the diamond is and that kind of thing, but I think it starts at about $9,000. Uh, but um, if you think about it, ashes are carbon. That's right. all that's left is carbon. And a, a diamond is formed by carbon put under extreme heat and extreme pressure for a very long time. And that's how real diamonds are formed. And this is not a cubic zirconium. It is by definition a real diamond. Fascinating. They, they take the carbon, you know, a, a bit of your ashes, and they put it under a million pounds of pressure per square inch under extreme heat for about a year. So again, they're just accelerating nature's process and your ashes form a diamond. Holy cow. That's amazing. I did not realize there were this many options. One of my favorites is you can actually be turned into river rocks. Um, uh, have you ever heard the term, again, from grandma? Uh, we learned so much from our grandparents. Uh, the term bone china. I have heard of it, but I don't know that. I thought it was a, a china. Bone it is. China. Well, okay. bone china is where they used to take ground bone, usually from a cow kind of thing. Okay. And they mix it with clay, put it under high heat, and it forms bone china. Or, or if it's processed a little bit more, it forms porcelain. Well, they can now take your ashes, do that exact same process, and it forms these great little river rocks uh, that are just beautiful. And uh, in my office, I have a little Zen fountain on the table and the little trickling water trickles down over these uh, beautiful little stones. And I point out to people that that's a dude. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Yeah. Wow, Dan, thank you for all this enlightening information on end of life and what we can do. I love yeah. it. People need to know that they have choices. They have and they a need lot to, of choices. And they need to know that they have rights. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, uh, When someone dies, uh, one of the things we realize as funeral directors is while we do this every day, the person on the other side of the table, this is the first time they've ever experienced death and, and of a loved one and how to handle it and all the legalities and things like that. But they are ultimately the client. Um, right. Uh, it, exactly. It's one thing to yeah, yeah. accept guidance from a funeral director, but you're still the boss. Got ya. Well, thank you for all that information. Can I ask you some interesting questions? Sure. So um, there's a lot of, you know, media out there. There are, there's videos of movies and stories. Do you have a favorite funeral story from anything you've ever watched or, or maybe something you've watched and went, that's not how it works. 
Um, well, I certainly, you know, I, I think every profession does that. I'm sure surgeons watch, you know, like Grey's Anatomy and go, oh, that doesn't my goodness, work. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, well, I, I will tell you one thing that uh, always gets me is when you're watching like a CSI type of show and they're in the morgue and it's like this high tech laboratory with a lot of glass and a lot of equipment and dials and the latest equipment, you know, just and most <laughs> every, like, where, where is this <laughs> yeah every morgue i've ever been in is in the basement of a building built in the 20s gotcha uh like here in st louis uh now st louis county uh about i don't know 15 years ago built themselves a beautiful new morgue facility uh, but st louis city is using the same morgue that they've probably had since the 1800s. So we don't have some fancy computerized something or other with I've, lots of I've, cool lights. I've assisted with autopsies at the medical examiner's office in New York, the most famous medical examiner's office in the world, the most famous autopsy suite in the world. And it looks nothing like that. Wow. It's, in, it's in the basement of an old building and, you know, um, uh, the old cinder block walls and that kind of thing. And, and, and they always seem to be in the basement. Like let's, let's reality. Hide. Yeah. This is reality, not all the fancy stuff. Yeah. All right. And you talked about cremation mm -hmm. and the bones. Is there anything else that survives the heat? Well, um, when somebody, uh, the, one of the questions we have to ask when somebody's cremated is, did they have a pacemaker? And we often get a look like, why do you want to know that? Anything with a battery, a pacemaker, a, a, um, a pain pump, a neurostimulator. Oh, yeah, no, you can't have that in there. They have a lithium battery and that little tiny lithium battery has the explosive power of a hand grenade. Yeah. Uh, and, and has actually killed people. Oh. Um, so, uh, and will destroy the, the, the machine. Um, the, so we, we actually have to remove those from the body before the person goes into that the, makes the sense. machine. But what does obviously, uh, survive is one of my favorite things is the snap on your blue jeans. If somebody's cremated wearing their blue jeans, the little snap on your Levi Strauss is really affected. That's uh, a party uh, snap right there. Yeah. All right. I'm going to look at those in a whole new way. I have a whole yeah. new appreciation for them. And of course, uh, prosthetics, your, your titanium knee, your steel hip, the rod in your leg, the, the pins in your hand, those all, all survive. So yeah. when, when the uh, bones come out, um, the first thing we do is go over it with a very powerful magnet to catch any of those pins or screws or whatever. Uh, so they don't damage the, the processing machine. I caught a, um, a another video recently with you and your daughter, Shannon. Oh, on Tell NPR. me about your daughter. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, yeah, to, uh, the love of my life. Um, she is, uh, um, I named her Shannon uh, because we're proud Irish people, uh, but her middle name is Valerie. And it's not spelled the normal way. It's spelled uh, V-A-L-O-R-Y uh, to be the female version of the word valor. I love it. And I wanted her to grow up to be this female warrior. There's an ancient uh, Irish legend of a, a band of female warriors. And um, she is uh, with Wash U Medical School, the Department of Neurology. And um, uh, she, she's a wonderful girl. And when NPR contacted me and asked me to do the StoryCorps story, they said, do you have a member of your family that uh, uh, would be willing to do this for you? And I have also have a son, but he's an Air Force officer and was in the middle of flight school uh, when that was recorded. And, okay. you know. But I was amazed at the hours of prep that it took to do that. There was rehearsals and we got called a half a dozen times by researchers doing fact checking and all this stuff back and forth. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I, and and you record for an hour for so, so that they can get, you know, two minutes and, and right. three seconds of, of uh, usable footage, I guess. 
So um, is, it was really awesome. I was and, and I, I was like, oh, you could just see you beaming. Nah, she well, <laughs> and here's the thing: is Shannon is just chronically shy. Uh, she's a proud introvert, and what we didn't realize was how many people apparently listen to NPR because when the, the day this thing came out, she's sitting in her desk and got a phone call from the chancellor of Washington University and all these department heads from the medical school and all this kind of stuff. And she got so mad at me because <laughs> oh, no. she doesn't like attention. Too much attention. Even, gotcha. pos even positive attention. Now, I'm somebody who would take that and run with it and milk it for everything I could get out of it. And she, <laughs> she wouldn't speak to me for a month afterwards. Oh, no. <laughs> oh she was livid. It's like, dad, everybody knows. <laughs> I don't want, you know, she, she's one of those, you know, just let me do my work. Nobody notice I'm even here. And in 30 years, give me a pension. So <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Well, Dan, I really appreciate your time today. This has been this has been eye opening. It's so interesting. It really is fascinating. And I, I, I mean that sincerely that this is one of the most fascinating things I have ever dealt with because uh, there have been so many changes in our society. Uh, I mean, if you, you just look at the 20 years ago where we were with smartphones and computers. Right. It, it, we're going by leaps and bounds, yet we still handle our dead the way we handled them in 1916. Nothing has really changed. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, uh, the funeral industry has intentionally kept this veil of secrecy up so that you don't know what's going on behind that curtain. And uh, I don't believe it should be that way. I believe in the family having as much participation as possible. Um, uh, when I go to pick up a deceased at someone's home, I invite the family to help me shroud the body and put them on the gurney and follow me out to the van and just to get as much participation as possible. Wow. Um, because I believe they get that closure. You asked about one of my, my stories. Uh, I'll tell you one of my absolute favorite stories that literally changed my outlook on this entire business. I was picking up a deceased gentleman from a hospice facility. And normally when I go to pick them up, they just tell me what room they're in and I go in there and it's just me and him. Well, I open this door and there's like 12 people in there. There's like three generations of the family all sitting there. They were still there visiting with him. And I said, oh, okay, so I got to put on my public face here. <clears throat> and uh, the nurse was with me and the doctor was with me and uh, they introduced me. And so I said, well, I, I want you to know what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, shroud him in a pretty blue sheet and take him into my care and, you know, uh, back at the funeral home. And I, I gave him my usual spiel, which is, um, uh, you know, some people want to stay in the room. Other people uh, don't want this as their last visual. Uh, and and I, I say that I, at the time I was saying that to try and encourage people to leave. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I've got to roll him over and I've got to, you know, scoot him over and I've got to manhandle him and, and then cover him up. And a lot of people don't want that to be their last visual. But anyway, I'm standing there and his five-year-old granddaughter looks up and says, can I help? And everybody froze, everybody froze. The doctors, the nurse, the family, they all froze and their eyes got this big around and, and their eyes just all went to me like. Oh, shoot, like no one's giving any, oh, <laughs> they're like, uh, what are you gonna oh, say here? Crap. <laughs> and, and, and at that instant, something hit me and I just got a big smile on my face and I leaned over and I said, absolutely, you can help. And um, so she helped shroud him in the sheet. She helped pull him over onto the gurney. She asked if she could buckle the seat belts that hold him in place. I'll be darn, how interesting. And it just filled me with such joy. It, it, from that moment on, I now always invite the family to stay and help. Because uh, I feel that they get some closure out of it. Yeah. They get to, they touch the body, they wrap the body up, they see the body They're a go part away. Of the process. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and and now 
I'm not made of stone. Uh, uh, when the, the shrouded body is put on the gurney and seat belted in, we then put a cover over him. A nice, a pretty blue velvet cover goes over the body. And when I started to put that over, uh, over him, uh, the granddaughter said, can he breathe under there? Oh. And that's when I lost it. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I, have, I have seen death in every possible state. Um, and I, when you're in this business, you, you go through these stages of, well, when you first get in the business, can I handle seeing a dead body? And then you right. see one and you're like, okay, yeah. that's not so bad. Uh, then it's, can I, how am I going to handle a decomposed body? How am I, how am I going to handle a burned up body? And then you go to, uh, how am I going to handle it if, when it's an infant? And I've had to basically wrench dead infants out of a crying mother's oh, hands. I can't imagine. Um, and uh, uh, then the next step is, what if I get there and it's somebody I know, uh, or even a family member? Now I've had, got me crying. I've I had that. I can't imagine. I've had that happen with a coworker of mine. He got there and it was his best friend's uh, uh, eight-year-old son. Oh. Um, and then, uh, so you go through all these things and, and somewhere along the line, there's going to be something that tears you up. And what tears me up is small children crying because you're taking mom away right. or grandma away. That's my breaking point is small children crying over the deceased. Um, because you know how children, the difference between an adult crying and a child crying, a child crying is so you feel desperate, it. so, yeah. so lost. So my world is over kind of crying. Exactly. And yeah. Oh, so God. I'm not made of stone. Well, no, I can't imagine you would be. And, um, and wow, I mean, it's, it is an amazing journey that you've had and that you've shared with us and a real eye opener, you know, I mean, I don't know, I might be bone China someday. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, please feel free to use this as my audition for a Ted talk. Someday. All right, sir. Hey, well, it's <laughs> definitely, you know, we're going to be back. TEDx St. Louis is, uh, we're, we're coming back with some interesting things. So thank you. I love it. No problem. Well, thank you, Dan Flynn, and everyone you. out there. You have been listening to Mishmash. Uh, have wonderful days, and we love you. Bye.